This video is brought to you by BoardGamePrices.com. Find the best prices for board games at BoardGamePrices.com. Kia ora koto, and welcome to 10 classic board games that don't suck. Now the idea behind this video isn't that these are the only classic board games that don't suck. It's more about how there are plenty of classic board games that are still fun to play. One thing I see an awful lot of people do in this hobby is, is punch down on toy store games. To rip on people because they like Monopoly, or Scrabble, or whatever the game is. There's an arrogance, a level of dismissiveness involved in this process. Treating people who haven't converted to the wonders of hobby board gaming as though they're some kind of inferior or muggles, if you would. But I don't want to get too negative on this. I'm not here to bury people because they're critical of classic games. So instead, I'm here to shine a light on some classic games I think are worthy of a second look. So if someone says, I really like board games, one of these is my favorite, you know, you can always consider playing it with them and then maybe sharing a game you like with them. We'll kick off with some honorable mentions that don't quite make the top 10. The first honorable mention is the most obvious game, and that's Monopoly. And Monopoly isn't that bad if you're playing with the auction rules and you're not putting money in free parking. Still not great, but it's nowhere near as bad as many people make it out to be. The next one is Backgammon, and the reason it's not in my top 10 is I've never actually played Backgammon. But Steph, my partner, absolutely adores Backgammon, and has been suggesting we buy a very expensive set for some time now. So this one gets an honorable mention because of her. And then finally, and this is stretching the definition of what a board game is, because it does have a board, is Darts. I mean, darts is a dexterity game, but I'm mostly including darts here because if you've seen the television coverage of it, it is an amazing example of how you can take a basic game and turn it into a television event. Alright, so let's head into the list. The first game I'm going to mention is Bridge. Now, I've only played Bridge a few times, and it was very much in a teaching situation, so a lot of the complex interactions of Contract Bridge are completely and utterly lost on me. But the main reason I'm bringing it up is not so much about the game being fantastic, although from my limited plays I can see there's some excellent skill and expertise required to play this game well. It's about Bridge's infrastructure. Now, here's a curious thing. Bridge as a game is kind of dying out. Most of its fan base are quite old, and not a lot of new players are coming into the hobby. But what Bridge has is unparalleled infrastructure structure. In my city alone there are seven trust protected bridge clubs and I know this is true across an awful lot of the first world as well. There's this massive protected infrastructure here to support the play of one board game. But what if that infrastructure didn't exist just for that one game? What if all these bridge halls at some point became board gaming halls? So the main reason I'm bringing bridge up is to kind of suggest to people that maybe you should join your local bridge club. Maybe you should get on the committee. Maybe if you're worried about places to organize events and stuff there's a great place to start. And maybe over time, they might not just be bridge clubs. Hashtag Occupy Bridge. Number nine on my list is a game that simply makes more money than any other game. And people will talk about Magic the Gathering and say, oh, Magic the Gathering is this big money maker. Yeah, Magic makes nothing compared to what poker does. Poker, in many ways, is the default board game evening activity for an awful lot of people around the world. As many of us are sitting down to play Catan or Terraforming Mars, there'll be another table playing poker somewhere else. And while the downsides of poker are the horrific gambling associated with it, which ruins lives and generally causes a lot of social problems, poker night with your friends can be an awful lot of fun. It's just a game that's not great for people with addictive personalities. But what it has going for it is it only takes a deck of cards, you don't have to play with money, you can play with chores or buttons or Skittles and M&Ms. So yeah, for your next games night, consider playing a poker night with a rule that the winner has to spend their winnings on a board game of their choice that they have to bring to the next gathering. Number eight is a game that gets overlooked quite a bit when people are talking about classic games, and it's one that people diss a fair bit as well. But it's been a disturbingly influential game, and that's Yahtzee. Now Yahtzee, taking five dice, rolling them, making sets. Really simple idea. A lot of people enjoy and play this game, but there are an awful lot of hobby games highly influenced by it. Straight off the bat, Elder Sign and the Doctor Who time of the Dalek game, heavily borrow from Yahtzee for their core gameplay. I mean, it's not inaccurate to call Elder Sign Cthulhu Yahtzee. And yeah, if someone says Yahtzee's their favorite game, taking a game like Elder Sign or Doctor Who Time of the Daleks or any of those dice manipulation games like Kohaka or Roll for the Galaxy, those could be good games for someone who likes Yahtzee to consider trying. You could consider showing them one of those games and seeing if they like it as well. Or you could just play Yahtzee, it's perfectly fine. Number seven was one I contemplated not putting on the list because I don't know whether it counts as a classic game, even though it came out in the 60s. 
And I saw it in toy shops growing up, and I know an awful lot of people who wouldn't consider themselves board gamers played it. And that's diplomacy. Now the problem with diplomacy is that it's evil. It's an evil, evil game. It destroys relationships like very few other games can. In fact, I had a boss at work years ago who, after finding out I liked board games, said to me, Jay, I want you to organize a diplomacy game for the rest of the leadership team. We'll all play and, and you can be the judge. And person who updates the board, what do you think of that? And my response was, Chief, you do want your team to like each other at the end of this, don't you? Upon realizing that introducing diplomacy into his leadership team would probably destroy his team rather than build it, he decided to back down on that idea. But diplomacy is a unique experience, and its influences can be found in games like A Game of Thrones. The great thing about diplomacy is its core idea is so refined and so simple within the game that you can't distill the concept really any further. So all its imitators and games that have been influenced later have simply been diplomacy and this mechanic. Diplomacy with this extra added thing. And that's a sign of a really well designed game. Speaking of games that destroy relationships, here's Risk. Now Risk is one of those games that gets maligned an awful lot by people, and with good reason. Yeah, the person who fortifies in Australia normally wins. Yes, the game can drag on for an insane amount of time if people have stockpiled enough resources. But it did create a genre almost by itself, and that's the dudes on a map genre. Successive games have taken Risk, added bells and whistles to it, but Risk has been just hugely influential throughout all board gaming from games like Axis and Allies, through to modern takes like Blood Rage or Lords of Hellas. All of them grandfather back to Risk. And of course I've mentioned Spheres of Influence, which I think is just better Risk in another video. But you know what? If someone said, I want to play Risk, that's the one game I know how to play, I'd be okay with that. The next game is the first game I ever read a book about. It's also the only game I've been in a musical about. Those two things alone should tell you exactly what I'm talking about. And that's chess. I don't feel the need to say too much about chess, it's ubiquitous, it's a global phenomenon, it's been played for a thousand years or more, and there are clubs all over the place. There was a chess club at our school, I imagine there's a chess club at an awful lot of schools. Now I'm not the greatest chess player, I'm okay. I do have a friend who was one of those people who used to play 16 people at the same time in a park, and I never stood a chance against that guy, and it was playing against him that made me go, I don't think I've got the commitment to this game to get good enough to really really want to play it a lot. And I'll tell you about its popularity as well. There are numerous chess channels on YouTube with over 500,000 subscribers. And worldwide, there are millions and millions of players. And for good reason. It's almost the definition of easy to learn and a lifetime to master. It is a lifestyle game. And you can play for 20 years every day and still not master the game. And that's amazing in a way. Next up is one of my favorite games when I was about five, six, or seven, and that's Stratego. Stratego came out in the 1940s, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a two-player game with hidden information. A little bit like chess if you're not too sure where your opponent's pieces were. Stratego is a capture the flag game, so it is kind of like chess where you're trying to take the king. But as pieces are only revealed when they're used for the first time, and then they go back to being hidden, there's an element of misdirection and memorization involved in the game as well. Stratego is not as deep as chess, but it's just as easy to teach, and I think a bit more fun as well. And another game that's influenced a fair few games down the years. For example, Lord of the Rings The Confrontation, and a lot of hidden information war games like Europe Aflame and Europe Engulfed. Unlike some others on this list, Stratego is one I actually want to play again, like right now. If someone had a copy of it, I'd love to give it a go again. I don't think I've played it in 25, 30 years. Number three is the king of word games, and that's Scrabble. Scrabble has an amazing following around the world. It's another lifestyle game that people really seriously get into. Uh, there's a New Zealand guy who won the French Scrabble Championship despite not speaking French. He just memorized their dictionary and somehow still managed to win. That is an amazing intellectual feat. A terrifying intellectual feat, but, but an example of the depth of mastery that can happen in the world of Scrabble. Scrabble is one of those games I legitimately think is better than not just most classic board games, but most hobby board games. As long as you're agreeing on the same set of words, it's deep, it's intellectually challenging, it's simple to learn, but really hard to master. I legitimately enjoy Scrabble, and if people are doing that at Games Day, I would be more than happy to play again. Number two is the Toy Store game I think is the most amazing Toy Store game that has ever been published. 
The term Toy Store games thrown around a bit to make light of some games like Candyland or The Game of Life. Games that are high luck, and in some cases, nothing but luck. But this Toy Store game came out in the 80s and it still holds up well today against a large number of hobby games. And that game is Scotland Yard. To my knowledge, Scotland Yard is the genre-defying game for hidden movement. In this game, one person is Mr. X, a fugitive on the run, and the other players are various police trying to capture them. And Mr. X has hidden movement and can move all around the board. Later games like Fury of Dracula, Last Friday, and Letters from Whitechapel have evolved this idea and used this idea, but they all use the same core concepts. When I played this as a kid, it was head and shoulders above the other Toy Store games. Like it was a real mind bender. And after over 35 years in publication, there are hidden movement games I think do it better and that I prefer more, but it's not by much. All of the core ideas are in this game. And that's why I think Scotland Yard is the best Toy Store game that has ever been published. And one that's got a profound legacy in hobby board gaming. And finally, a game I have only played a few times, and that's just enough to make me know how utterly ignorant I am of this game. And that is Go. The things I said about chess and Scrabble, about being easy to learn, yet taking a lifetime to master, they are absolutely true of Go as well, if not more so. And even commenting on the game, I feel like a tourist describing a country based on what they've seen at the airport. Go is also the oldest game on this list, I believe, and probably has the biggest player base out of any board game. And although its home is very much in China, it has become a global phenomenon. And for all the other games in the list, if I was offered a chance to play them, I would, and I'd be happy to. But if someone offered to play Go with me, I'd really respect that, because I know it's a game there's a hell of a lot more I can learn about. And if anyone came to me and said, let's play Go, I wouldn't dismiss them as a casual gamer, a tourist, or someone who hasn't been enlightened to hobby gaming. I'd probably just look at it as an opportunity to learn something more. So that's my list. And I'll just finish off by reiterating what I said at the start. If someone's favorite game is Monopoly, don't rip on them. Don't try to flex about your superior knowledge of board games. You just end up sounding like a dick. And if you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon.